Want to know more about the hot job markets in the Portland, Vancouver market? Find out next on Smart Money. Welcome to Smart Money. I'm Julia Anderson, and this is my co-host, Pat Boyle. We're here to talk to a real expert on the labor market in the Portland, Vancouver area, economist Amy Vandervliet. And Amy, let's start out with some basics about the labor market. Uh, first of all, how big is it in terms of all the people who are either in the job or looking for a job? And then we can go into some of the more of the basics with you from there. So let's get us started. Okay. Um, thanks for having me. Um, yeah. So the <laughs> the Portland Vancouver metropolitan area is a seven county area, uh, five counties in Oregon and two in uh, Washington. And combined, we have a labor force of about 1.3 to 1.4 million people. And that makes us the 23rd largest metropolitan area in the nation. So we're about the same size as Austin and Orlando. Um, and of those 1.4 million people, about all but about 50,000 people are actually employed. So that gives us an unemployment rate of 3.8%, which is, uh, it's been falling dramatically and it's coming down close to where we were before the pandemic, which is 3% when there, we had 40,000 people unemployed. So we're getting back down to historic lows. And in terms of jobs, we've added about 61,000 jobs over the last year in the seven county area. And, and that's a that's a pretty remarkable rate of growth when you consider our long time or long term average is about two percent. So we're it's been pretty remarkable recently. Yeah, it's been a long two years since the pandemic started. How mm -hmm. has the job recovery been in Portland, Vancouver, compared to the rest of the nation? Do you have any numbers that have been crunched? Yeah, I take a look at this uh, pretty often because it's a very common question. People want to know, you know, how we're doing relative to like Seattle and Austin and things like that. So. Uh, the median large metropolitan area, um, we're, we're trailing. Uh, it's the median large metropolitan area, of, and these are like the 100, 100 largest metropolitan areas in the nation. Uh, they're about 1.8% away from a full recovery, and Portland is about 2.4%. So if you were to rank us, there'd be about 60 large metropolitan areas that are doing better than we are. Either they're closer to recovery or they're actually above where they were before the pandemic hit. And then you have 40 metropolitan areas that are trailing Portland. So right now we're neck and neck with Seattle in our recovery, uh, San Jose, Chicago, I think, and, and Philadelphia. And the, the real superstars right now in terms of growth are uh, Provo. Actually, a lot of uh, Utah is doing quite well. Uh, Austin, Boise, and then at the bottom of the list, you have the tourist-dependent cities of Honolulu and um, New Orleans. Well, I, I think you had given us some numbers, Amy, about um, the Portland-Vancouver recovery. Uh, March is at 83% compared to the national average of 93%. Was that what it was? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what's the issue with our being a little bit behind? It sounds like uh, we're certainly behind the, the national average. Yeah, we are. And there's probably a, a many different reasons for that. But I'll start off first with saying that the nation came started to come out of the – well, it, it came out stronger um, in the initial months of the recovery than Oregon and Portland. So we we're on a similar trajectory of growth. We both had the same number of months of decline, and we both turned the corner in April. But uh, the U.S. came out faster. Uh, part of that has to do with schools, a lot of schools in the South and the Midwest and and parts of the Northeast were, went back to in-person learning before Oregon did. And Oregon also had, I think, the eighth longest um, shutdown or public policy measure put into effect uh, compared to the rest of the nation. So we were a little bit uh, slower coming out of, of the um, recession. But so for the first year between the summer 2020 and the summer 2022, uh, 21, Oregon uh, lagged the U.S. The U.S. was outperforming Portland and Oregon by about one or two percentage points. But then last July, Oregon and Portland started to grow a little faster than the nation. It's a, it's a similar trajectory again, but we are now slightly outpacing the nation. So my point is that although we're lagging, we are, we are catching up. And so going back to those reasons, uh, if you compare Portland to, the or to Oregon, 
Portland is is lagging Oregon, and that's what a lot of people are focused on right now. It's like, why is that happening? And we're down 2.4%. Oregon's down 1.8%. So it's a gap. It's not huge, but it's a gap. And I just want to start out by saying we're not unique in this respect. Half of the largest urban areas in uh, the nation are trailing their respective states' recovery, and for some of the same reasons that Portland is trailing Oregon's. And the first and foremost among those for me is that uh, Portland is the largest city in Oregon, and it's a employment hub. It's the major employment hub in the state. And you have tens and tens of thousands of people coming into Portland, or you did, to work every day in their offices. And they went out to lunch, they dropped off dry cleaning, they went to the gym, they shopped, they went out for drinks after work. I mean, they created huge demand for all these other jobs in the downtown urban core. And those workers stayed away from downtown Portland in the early days of the pandemic. And thousands of them are still working remotely. So you had this uh, decreased demand for the services that supported these workers. So that's that's one reason. Uh, and another reason is that Portland is more dependent than the rest of the state on business travel. We have the convention center, trade shows, you know, conferences, things like that. And uh, business travel came to screech to a halt in the early months of the pandemic. And it's been really slow to recover. And we don't, at least nationally, they don't expect a full recovery um, until 2024, maybe. And again, it's going to be dependent on on COVID. Uh, the third reason, uh, main reason, is that tourism is still down. It's come back, but uh, it's, it's not to where it was before the pandemic. And again, these people create a demand for, and these are both people within Oregon coming to Portland and outside of Oregon and internationally. And they create a demand for hotel rooms and restaurants and entertainment venues and things like that. So business, tra I mean, I'm sorry, domestic air travel is still down at PDX by about 30%. And international travel is down about uh, 50%. So we still have a ways to come back from that. And I guess finally, I would mention that uh, Portland is also home. It, we're unique in that we're home to these large venues that other areas of the state can't support, like like the Rose Garden, like concert venues and sports arenas and, and the convention center. And although those areas are coming back, museums and zoos, uh, they're not back to where they were. Well, speaking of recovery, um, asking you to get out your crystal ball or pretend, uh, get out your crystal ball, how optimistic are you that the Portland-Vancouver area will see full recovery by the end of 2022? And what's going to drive that? Okay, so if, I'm, I'm going to borrow someone else's crystal ball, uh, the Go Office ahead. of Economic Analysis. Uh, those are the folks down to Salem that come out with these employment forecasts once a quarter, so very regular regularly updated employment and revenue forecasts. And so I always turn to them um, when we're looking at the short term. And yes, they do expect their latest forecast came out in March. Their next one comes out in two weeks, I think. So I'm going to be um, keeping an eye on that. But their latest forecast predicted that Oregon would recover all the jobs that it lost during the pandemic by this fall. So by yes, by the end of 2022. And Portland, I expect, will follow suit. So what's driving th the recovery is a few things. One, there's still a pandemic bounce back, like the industries that were cut or that were hit pretty hard during the recession, like leisure and hospitality. That's That industry is still bouncing back from the pandemic losses. But then you also have underlying economic expansion. The U.S. economy is, is still strong and that impacts Oregon. There's still spending, there's still demand. So all industries are going to be adding jobs throughout the year. It's just not going to be one sector it's going to be all sectors adding jobs. So it's sort of everything working together um, to to return to pre-pandemic employment levels. And that said, not all industries are going to recover at the same pace. There are certain industries like healthcare and education and leisure and hospitality will still be lagging their pre-pandemic levels, but um, they'll all be growing. So that sort of touch touches on my question, which is, you not only look at the big numbers in terms of the total number of people working and not working, but you also break out the labor market by category. So you've got uh, separate categories for manufacturing, how many people are working in that category, 
uh, hospitality and leisure you mentioned, healthcare, mm -hmm. social services, uh, the big banking category. I can't remember what you call it, but anyway, there's a lot of categories. So tell us which ones of these categories are the strongest right now and which ones might be lagging in terms of adding jobs. Well, right now, uh, leisure and hospitality is leading the pack by far in terms of job growth. And again, you're seeing this pandemic bounce back. It's added 26,000 jobs over the year, March to March. And that accounts for about half of the jobs, all the jobs that have been created in the metropolitan area over the year. So that's, uh, they're going great guns. But again, it's this pandemic bounce back. Um, all industries are growing. Um, every single industry has added jobs over the past year. And you, know, you talked about manufacturing. Manufacturing is doing pretty well in Portland. We're uh, up about 6,000 jobs over the year, which is a growth rate of, I think, over 5%, which is pretty good. I mean, it's, it, it goes up and down, and we're on an upward trajectory right now. And we're, uh, we're still down about a percent from where we were before the pandemic, as is the nation. But over the last year, 6,000 jobs is, is pretty good. And I think that number would be higher if employers... Uh, could find enough workers because when you when you talk manufacturing in Portland, you're talking about high tech, and you're also talking about metals and non durable good manufacturing, which is like think food processing and food products, and these employers, not just in manufacturing but across all industries, are struggling to find workers. And I saw an ad in uh, on TV for Intel adding or advertising job openings and driving down 84 the other day, I saw a billboard advertising for another semiconductor uh, company saying, Hey, come work for us. So uh, strong growth in manufacturing. And I suspect it would be stronger had, uh, if employers could find enough workers. Hmm. That is interesting. Yeah. That's one of the big challenges. I wonder what Provo Utah is doing that they're faring better than Vancouver, Portland is right now. Can we borrow some of their go-to moves? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cheaper. I think it's cheaper there. <laughs> you know, yeah, um, I'd like to know. I, I dug into this and I, I, I still have to come up with an answer because it's not just Provo. It's, it's the three major metropolitan areas in Utah that are above where they were in, prior to the recession. So I don't know what's going on down there. Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges is wages. I've seen on fast food restaurants, it'll say, uh, uh, come work for us. We're hiring and you get to keep tips. I mean, they're really trying to bring people in. What are the biggest challenges beyond wages uh, that employers are facing as they try to get the workforce back to work? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, employers are competing for a limited number of workers and they're uh, raising wages. They're offering more flexibility in, in scheduling. They might be taking another look at their bonus packages and, and benefits. Uh, and, there are, and speaking of bonuses, a lot of companies, especially in healthcare, you see offering signing bonuses, um, but you see that across many industries. So employers are doing a lot to try to attract a very limited number of, of workers. So the tight labor markets is, is, a, is a huge challenge for workers right now. Um, we do a vacancy, a job vacancy survey throughout the year in Oregon and, and for Portland. And vacancies are at an all-time high, both Oregon, in Oregon and in Portland. Last year... At any given time in, in the Tri-County area in Portland, at any given time, there were 40,000 job openings. Employers were looking to fill 40,000 jobs. And at the same time, you have a record high number of quits. You know, people are quitting their jobs, presumably not to exit the labor market, but to, look, to get a better job, whether better means better pay or working conditions or closer to home or whatever. So it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge out there. It's an employee, it's a job seekers uh, market right now. Uh, there is a little bit of, you know, give or a little bit of um, cushion in that there are still people who have not returned to the labor force since the pandemic started. About a year ago, it was 60,000 people in Oregon. And that's, that's dropped. Actually, that's for COVID-related reasons. But people are still sitting on the sidelines. Um, they could be uh, coasting on their, their partner's earnings. They could be waiting for a better paying job. They could be uh, having problems finding childcare and need to stay home to take care of their kids. That's a big problem. And then there's COVID, and I just talked about this, but COVID-related reasons account for about 20 or 23,000 people not working today as opposed to um, before the pandemic. So uh, there is some play right now that there's still, you know, 
There are some people that employers could maybe lure back into the labor force, but there's not a lot. We Our labor force participation is higher today than it was before the pandemic. Very interesting. You are full of information. So uh, we haven't talked about inflation. Uh, we do know that employers are having to raise wages in order to attract new workers and keep the ones they have. What else is this 8% inflation rate nationally that we're experiencing right now? What else is that doing to among the challenges that employers are facing? Yeah, the uh, it's... the. Relationship of inflation to jobs and job growth is, is, is complicated and it, it's right. tricky. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. The, 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 I mean, there's a billion ways to answer this and a billion different people will tell you a billion different things. But um, the short answer is that uh, inflation is not having much of an impact, if any, on the job market right now, Hmm. uh, the labor force. And I'm talking about jobs. So yes, people are feeling it at the pumps. They're feeling it at the grocery store. When they go to take out a mortgage, they're certainly feeling it there. So it's here and people are feeling it, but it hasn't, you know, thus far households have been able to absorb those higher prices. Consumers are still spending. Spending is still up over the year, not by much because inflation has taken a bite out of that. But Demand is still strong. And when demand is still strong and households are able to absorb these price increases, then job growth will remain strong. So that's not to say it's not a concern. Uh, it's not affecting us too much right now. But if it if it stays high, uh, yes, it's definitely a risk to, to the economic outlook. Uh, so last year, it was a little lower and people thought it was transitory. It was mostly... Um, due to chip shortages and labor supply issues. And people thought it was just going to pass. People, it, Things would settle down, we'd figure it out, and a year later we'd be fine. But that hasn't been the case. It's it's become more broad-based. And that's where the Fed comes in right now. So we're having, we're, we're, we have high inflation that's lasted longer than people expected. And so the Fed is going to try to cool off the, the economy by raising interest rates. And the, the trick is to walk that fine line between uh, acting too quickly and too severely, like raising rates too fast and too high versus not raising them enough and going too slowly. So there's a fine line. And right now, they're, they need to engineer the, kind of this soft landing. And the risk is that if they don't, this could lead to a boom bust cycle and then a possible recession. And then that's where you see those job losses. But that's farther away, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's people aren't expecting this to happen in the next year or so. You know, right. some people are, but the consensus still is 2022 is going to be OK still. The economy is still strong. Demand is still strong. Spending is still up. We've been talking to Amy Vandervliet, the economist with the uh, Oregon Department of Employment, and she's been tracking the job market in the metro area, which includes uh, six counties, five of them in Oregon and one in Clark County. So she's got the, the, uh, the, the handle on all of this. And this has been an excellent interview, Amy. Thank you so much for joining us on Smart Money. Thank you. For more information, go to my website at 60andsingle.com.